Secretary General of OIC, respected foreign ministers, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me welcome all of you to Pakistan. Uh, the irony is that 41 years ago, the extraordinary meeting of the OIC was held in Pakistan. It was discussing Afghanistan. And since then, all the troubles of Afghanistan started. No country, no country has suffered as much as Afghanistan. Forty years of conflict. And then add to it recently prolonged drought. 75% of the people living off the land. And then, even before 15th of August, half the population below the poverty line. Years, years of corrupt governance. 75% of the budget supported by foreign aid. Now, a country in this situation, after 15th August, if the foreign aid dries up, the foreign reserves get frozen, banking system freezes, any country is going to collapse, let alone Afghanistan, which has uh, suffered for the past 40 years. So I'm really glad all the speakers before me mentioned the gravity of the situation. Uh, especially, I would like to uh, point out what Michael Griffith, Under Secretary of the, uh, of the United Nations uh, Secretary General, what he had to say, the figures he gave. So the point is that if the world does not act, this will be the biggest man-made crisis which is unfolding in front of us. We, uh, the OIC, it's a big responsibility on us because not only is it the situation in Afghanistan as it unfolds, but it's a religious duty to help them. And I must say that we have to, and I, and I speak to uh, the United States specifically, they must de-link the Taliban government from the 40 million Afghan citizens. Even if they have, uh, they've been in conflict with Taliban for 40 years, uh, 20 years, but this is a question of the people of Afghanistan, 40 million human beings. And that's why it is very important that action is taken immediately. Already we are late. The Afghan winter, everyone knows, is extremely severe. And these uh, preconditions the Taliban have to, uh, unless they have an inclusive government, human rights, women rights, uh, uh, do, do not allow terrorism from the soil, unless these preconditions are met, uh, the humanitarian aid will not flow and their their foreign reserves won't be, uh, they won't be allowed to have them, or the banking system won't function, won't be allowed to function. This is very important. That first of all, my, the one time I met the Taliban foreign minister, he categorically said that they, they, they wanted to uh, comply with these three conditions. Now the point is, we must understand that Every, when we talk about human rights, every society is different. Every society's idea of human rights and women's rights are different. i just give you an example of, uh, of, of the Pakistan, the Pakhtunkhwa province which uh, borders Afghanistan. Because the culture is similar because they are, Taliban is basically uh, predominantly a Pashtun movement and there are more Pashtuns on our side of the border. Now, the city culture is completely different with the rural culture. Kabul, culture in Kabul was always different to 
rural areas. Just like in Peshawar, it is completely different, the culture, to the district adjoining the Afghanistan border. So I give you an example. We give stipends to the girl's child's parents to put the girls into school. But in our uh, uh, tribal districts or the district adjoining Afghanistan, if we, if, the, if, the, if we are not sensitive to the cultural norms of the, those people, even with stipends, they won't send their girls to school. But if we are sensitive to their cultural norms, without stipends, they're willing to send their girls to school. So this sensitivity, I'm afraid, when we are talking about human rights and women's rights, we have to be sensitive about this. But my big worry is that unless action is taken immediately, and I mean immediately, because we've been saying this for now two, three months, unless action is taken immediately, Afghanistan is heading for chaos. Any government, when it can't pay its salaries of its public servants, hospital, doctors, nurses, any government is going to collapse. But chaos suits no one. It certainly does not suit the United States. Because what if there's chaos there, and chaos means the inability, if the Afghan government does not have the ability to fight terrorism, and we know ISIL is now uh, a threat. It has been a threat. We have had attacks of, uh, from Afghan border, from ISIL, into Pakistan. So the only way you can uh, control what is, and ISIL is capable of international terrorism. And the only reason you can deal with it is if there's a stable Afghan government. And same with Pakistan. Our worry is, and remember, Pakistan lost 80,000 people. We were the biggest collateral damage of the Afghan war. Our economy was shattered. Over $100 billion lost to the economy. Three and a half million people internally displaced. Well, the last thing we want is a chaos in Afghanistan, more refugees. We already have over 3 billion Afghan refugees. To date, we have 234,000 Afghans who have overstayed their visa because they do not, they, their situation in Afghanistan means they can't go back. And remember, this is a country like most developing countries who are suffering from the fallout of the coronavirus. COVID-19, we are all suffering from the impact it has had on world economies. So we have no position to deal with this, another influx of refugees and, and terrorism. So my request to the international community, to the United States specifically, uh, I know the Europeans are extremely sensitive. They understand the situation. There's a refugee problem, not just in Europe, all over the world. So everyone knows that this chaos will lead not just countries like Pakistan and Iran. Other countries will also eventually have refugee problems. But in, in much richer countries, you have two, 3,000 refugees, and there's an issue. The far-right parties raised this issue about refugees. But we poor countries you know, who are struggling, whose economy is just about getting on their feet, how do we cope with hundreds and thousands of refugees? So it is in no one's interest that there's chaos in Afghanistan. And that's why I was very uh, impressed by the Islamic Development Bank's suggestions of immediate, medium, and long-term ways of uh, helping the people of Afghanistan or making the economy sustainable. Um, I would look forward to the uh, foreign ministers that you will come up with a roadmap by the end of this evening. And that roadmap not only should be pushed by the OIC, by the United Nations, by the European Union, and by, of course, the United States. Because as I repeat, chaos in Afghanistan suits no one. 
And finally, uh, because I have uh, this platform of the OIC foreign ministers, I would just raise two more points. One is Palestine and Kashmir. Uh, the people of Palestine and Kashmir look to us. They, they want to see a unified response from us about their human rights, about their democratic rights, rights which United Nations Security Council resolutions have given them, and unfortunately not implemented. We should, on every forum, raise our voices and a unified stance. And lastly, I want to talk about Islamophobia. Unfortunately, the refugee crisis in Western countries has exacerbated Islamophobia. Islamophobia really started uh, reaching a dangerous levels after 9-11. When terrorism and Islam were connected, when radical word terms like radical Islam came, they connected somehow Islam was, was responsible for terrorism and radicalize, radicalization. So this connection has made life difficult for people living in Western countries, Muslims living in Western countries. The man in the street in the West cannot distinguish between what is a moderate Muslim and what is a radical Muslim. So you have stuff like in New Zealand, a man walks into a mosque and shoots 50 people. It's because these, this term, radical Islam, Islamic terrorism, they have to be delinked. And secondly, the reason for Islamophobia is people in the West do not understand when our Prophet Muhammad Wasallam is mocked or ridiculed or insulted, they can't understand the reaction amongst the Muslims because their attitude to religion is different to ours. So it's very important for the OIC to play its part in explaining to the Western world on forums like European Union, United Nations, the think tanks, making them understand rather than this gap growing between Muslims and non-Muslims because of inability to understand Islam, it is our responsibility in the OIC that we make them understand. Uh, we have in Pakistan formed an authority it's called Ramatulil Alameen Authority. The purpose, the purpose is to have top m m Pakistani scholars in this authority who coordinate with Muslim scholars all over the world. And one of the objectives of this uh, uh, Ramatulil Alameen Authority is that there should be a, a considered intellectual response when things like um, uh, 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 a cartoon appears insulting a holy prophet, peace be upon him, there should be a proper response from scholars to make them understand why Muslims react, that the love and reverence we have for a holy prophet, peace be upon him, because they don't understand this. And secondly, to make them understand that a holy prophet was called Rahmatul al -Alamin. He was to bring mercy for mankind. He was not called Rahmatul Muslimin. He was not just for Muslims. Just like our God, Allah, is God of all human beings. So, a prophet united human beings. His whole message was of love. But this is not the people in the West do not understand this. There is so much propaganda against Islam. And unfortunately, we do not have a coherent and an intellectual scholarly response to this. So one objective of this authority is to, in coordination with all the Muslim scholars, we will respond and we would like the OIC Secretary General also to, to know about this response. We will consult you. And whenever anything happens, there should be a proper response to that. But secondly, it's also for my own country, because we feel 
that we can raise the morality and the ethics of our society by making people understand the seerat of the Prophet, his teachings, to raise the ethical standards in our country, and at the same time, unite our people. Because unfortunately, religion is used by elements in our society to divide people, spread hatred. The whole idea is to unite human beings uh, under the teachings of a prophet. Um, so finally, I again welcome all of you. I hope we, ha we have a very productive session this afternoon. And then we come up with a very coherent uh, a strategy, which I said immediate, medium term and long term, how to get Afghanistan out of this crisis. Thank you.